So who knows their subgroup? Who is a diffuse? You think? Who is a limited? Cutaneous? Okay, all right. So, so everything I say today doesn't apply to half of you. Every slide applies to one half and not the other half necessarily. But some stuff is overlapping, but you remember this, you need to be, and some people are sort of in between, as there is this, you can see, there is this intermediary uh, category. So the diffuse cutaneous, as the name indicates, is diffuse. It tends to affect more of the surface of the body. Um, extensive skin involvement, skin sclerosis, and that goes up proximal limbs and trunk, commonly, usually not in the back. And these people are actually in, particularly, in particular susceptible to develop lung disease early on in their life. So it's a very sort of acute, sudden, pervasive disease, and it tends to affect the lungs early. On the opposite side, is the limited, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. And before people celebrate the fact that they're limited and not diffused, the limited one has some interesting features, as in it tends to involve internal organs. These are the people that get the crest stuff. These are the people with GI symptoms. These are the ones that are likely to develop pulmonary hypertension, more likely to develop pulmonary hypertension. Less likely to develop interstitial lung disease, the scarring and the inflammation of the lung, but actually may develop it later on. So the diffuse people develop it early. That's why it's important as soon as you get diagnosed to sort of make sure you pay some attention to the lung because it could progress very quickly. The limited people have more time. They tend to tend to develop it a little later. Um, they have other, other issues. So the epidemiology of interstitial lung disease. So interstitial lung, so let's think of lungs. Lungs, the spongy organ, has no muscles in it, but it tends to expand and contract with the accordion that is ribs. I bet you hadn't thought about ribs as accordion, but that's exactly what it is. It opens up and closes up, just like an accordion. And the lungs are the sort of spongy thing inside. Typically, the diseases of the lung, there's three or four, depending on how you look at it, but there's airways. That's like asthma, smoker's lung disease. There's the blood vessels of the lung. That's pulmonary hypertension and other issues, PE, pulmonary embolism. And then there is the meat of the lung. And it's the meat of the lung that is sort of the subject of uh, damage to people with scleroderma. In addition to pulmonary hypertension, which we're not addressing today, that's a whole other set. But the meat of the lung gets affected and I am, uh, in, in, in some studies, 48%, uh, that's 50% of patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis and 26% of the limited patients had some degree of scarring of the lung in high resolution CAT scan. Now, that's a lot, right? But on the other hand, it's not necessarily the end of days. A lot of people with systemic sclerosis have some stuff going on in their lungs, but it doesn't always progress. It doesn't always become a bigger problem than everything else that's going on in life as you get older. And there are some things that actually make it that things will probably gonna not go for you, meaning higher prevalence and maybe worse disease. Uh, and that is being an African American, having a higher skin score, meaning thicker, wider, more affected, and uh, CPK, the enzyme level that shows um, changes in muscles and tissue, hypothyroidism and cardiac involvements. And if you, there's the antibody profile that can actually show you whether you go towards or against interstitial lung disease. So anti-centromere antibodies are protective and then SCL, scleroderma antibodies, are um, seem to sort of go for interstitial lung disease. So this is a slide I show my uh, colleagues, or we show each other and don't understand, so I'm gonna show it to you, and it's okay, we don't understand it. That's okay. But I thought about taking it away, but I thought, why? 
I show it to my fellows, and they say, yeah, whatever. So the worst that can happen is you should say the same thing. But I thought you would want to sort of see it of what happens. So initial injury, which we don't know what this is. A lot of people, how, how many of you did this happen just very aggressively, out of the blue, and very quickly? And a lot of people, it just comes out of the blue, and you can scratch your head, and you cannot remember what is it that you did or do that this happened. We don't know. Hopefully, research will um, elucidate what this is. But this injury happens, and then it triggers what is fibroblasts, which are cells that can differentiate into myofibroblasts, and these are sort of more developed cells whose job is to lay out collagen to fix things, or initially when you were developing as an embryo to actually create things. So these are the 3D printing sort of cells of the body. These are the ones that, for instance, when you have a scar, they heal by going in there and cross-linking, stitching everything with these little stitches. But it's the dysregulated, overwhelming presence of the stitches of these um, essentially fibrotic strands of collagen that defines this condition that leads to fibrosis. Now, every time you make something, your body has stuff to break it down as well. So it's not always just the scarring. It's also, in some people, the scarring goes unchecked and it doesn't stop. And so that's the problem. People who, who do scarring have a complicated cell physiology that involves in essentially breaking it down later on. And in this inflammation that starts and activates fibroblasts, B cells, T cells also get involved. So this is where you can see that there's two things going on in the fibrosis of the lung. Inflammation, inflammatory cells, and then fibrotic cells. Inflammatory cells, fibrotic cells. Two things. And so I have good news for you. It just was revealed a couple weeks ago. We're going to review it at the end. For the first time, an antifibrotic was worked to show was shown to work in scleroderma patients. Because until now, we were just basically using anti-inflammation anti to sort of stop these guys from doing this, from making the fibrils. But now we actually have antifibrotics that can work with the anti-inflammatories to do this. And we're going to go through some of that. So this is sort of the life cycle, in a way, of the both the two uh, disease states uh, of the um, um, people with um, skin thickness, people with, uh, sorry, limited, and people with diffuse. People limited start with reno, digital ischemia, and then, you know, they could conceivably um, end up with some interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, sort of later. But actually, with this relative to skin thickness, if your skin thickness is higher, you can develop skeletal myopathy, interstitial lung disease, etc., etc. And so different courses depending on how much skin involvement there is. What could happen to you with scleroderma and systemic sclerosis? Well, it turns out a lot of things can go wrong, which you should be aware of. So first of all, your physician is supposed to ask you whether you're short of breath. They're supposed to listen to you and listen for crackles. This is easy, right? And so any scleroderma patient that has any shortness of breath should let their physicians know that they have shortness of breath. Now, a lot of us are um, good Americans, and what does that mean? We're slightly overweight. I, um, I, unfortunately, after the last trip to Europe, which was, I'm sorry, last trip to Argentina, which was about, Three months ago, I am now officially obese. My BMI is over 30. Um, average American. So we could be short of breath just because we're not fit, not exercising. So if you're slightly short of breath, don't necessarily worry about it, but do tell your physicians because it may involve lung disease. And that's important because as we discussed, in some patients, it happens early and it happens aggressively and then usually if it scars up, you can't get it back. If it's inflamed, you can get it back. But if it scars up, you can't get it back. So what are some of the pulmonary involvements? Well, we talked about interstitial lung disease, 
Pulmonary hypertension comes there. That's another way of having interstitial lung disease. Now, sometimes, um, obviously, an echocardiogram is the, is the way we basically have to figure out whether you have a suggestion of pulmonary hypertension, and then that has to be worked up later on with a right heart cath to um, really um, show it. There's some airway disease, although it's not common. There's some pleural involvement. Uh, there's a condition where if you go to the ER and you say you have side pain, they diagnose you with pleurisy. That's what ER physicians like to do. This means pleural involvement, some inflammation. And bear in mind, a lot of people with systemic sclerosis don't have just systemic sclerosis. There's usually some overlap with Sjogren's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, other conditions, and that just adds so much loveliness to the whole thing. So, we talked about, um, and then you have indirect pulmonary involvements because of what happens, such as because you're taking anti-inflammatory drugs, do you need, um, you become more susceptible to infection. Because you're taking um, um, the drugs, you may have toxicity. Um, because you have scleroderma, you actually have a high rate of malignancy. And it's really hard because you see a nodule, a lot of people with scleroderma develop nodules as part of their other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, but they're actually at a higher likelihood of developing lung cancer. And we, though we haven't, we don't have necessarily a protocol to suggest that you should be screened on an annual basis for lung cancer, we know that it happens more often. And then a lot of people become short of breath, not because they have a lung problem or because of a heart problem, but they have a problem with the accordion. This happens in particular with people with diffuse disease, the ones where the chest is affected, the chest wall. So you're basically, your body is giving you a Victorian corset, which is tightening you down. And so that's normal when faced with that, that you It's always very complicated because it will sh you will be short of breath. It's not in the echo. And when we do a CAT scan, it's not in the lungs. But we can see it in the breathing test that the numbers are low. And then we conclude that you're restricted, which means you can't move. Now, if you don't have a chest wall problem, then you may have a diaphragm problem. And that can happen to diaphragmatic illnesses or respiratory muscle weaknesses. And then heart. Not just pulmonary hypertension, scleroderma actually involves the meat of the heart, myocardial disease, left-sided disease, very common also, and a reason to treat patients uh, aggressively. And then since everybody used to smoke, uh, COPD and asthma and other things always happen, and you have other diseases that we just uh, talked about. So it's really sort of a mixture of a whole bunch of things that can, uh, that can happen to patients with uh, with uh, systemic sclerosis. So what happens in the lungs? Remember we talked about inflammation from an etiology that we don't understand resulting in the activation of myofibroblasts who then deposit the scar tissue. So depending on how much inflammation you have versus how much activation of your myofibroblasts the lungs could be fluffy and not necessarily that scarry, and we call that cellular NSIP, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. If it's fluffy and scarry at the same time, it's called fibrotic NSIP, and it's not fluffy at all, and it's all just scarring, it's called usual interstitial pneumonitis. By the way, it's hard as hell to tell the difference. In fact, there is no difference between a UIP of a scleroderma patient and a UIP of a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's very hard. So if you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and scleroderma, you probably don't have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You have pulmonary fibrosis from scleroderma. So these are the, more the fibrotic types. And so people can be any one of these things. If you are the fibrotic type, till now, there wasn't anything great. We always hoped that we would stop the inflammation and um, see if that would help uh, stop the fibrosis. But without seeing the inflammation, it was a little strange to hope that it would actually work. It did actually work because we know that that's the steps. 
Because if the fibroblasts were activated on their own, we would call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We know that this is a scleroderma-induced one. And so, but until recently, for the last part of it, we didn't have any. So if you just go and grab somebody with scleroderma and do a CAT scan, a lot of them have a little bit of something. You may not feel it, you may not know about it, but you have something. And we can go and score this. Now a lot of us don't sit there with a computer tool and score them, we just kind of eyeball it. And the consensus was that less than 20%, it's not that bad. Now we think maybe it should be less than 10%, not that bad. But a lot of people have something. And if you have more, um, so inflammation and rapid loss of lung typically happens in the first four to six years, especially in the people with diffuse cutaneous. And then afterwards, it sort of slows down. Except for people with limited, in which case it may actually show up later and be kind of slow but, but steady. So you have one group that goes bad really quickly and then slows down, hopefully. Not always, although one fourth of them continue to get worse. And that's a problem. And so I'm going to actually stop here in the middle and see if uh, we can talk about some stuff before we get to the treatment part. Any thoughts? So, message here is if you haven't talked to your doctor about your lungs and you've been focusing on your skin appropriately because it hurts and it's painful, etc., you need to think about this because the skin, as torturous as it might be, is not going to necessarily kill you. It can, but it's not, typically. What typically gets you in scleroderma patients is actually the lungs, whether it's pulmonary hypertension or other conditions. Although the GI comes as a second with malnutrition. Fun topic. <laughs> I agree with it all day. And I'm sure you do too, so let's be cool about it. Yes? Okay. Is the person, are you saying they're like that because they have skin tightening in that yes. area? Okay. So, so the idea is, um, you're short of breath. I need to find out why. So first thing is heart versus lung. Heart, do an echo. It's good. Let's hope it's good. Put it aside. Lung. Okay. Is there scarring in the lung? Are you developing this interstitial lung disease? Do I have to give you inflammatory, anti-inflammatory and antifibrotics to decrease that? inflammation and scarring in the lung. No. Good. Okay, so if it's not this, if it's not that, then it's got to be either the muscles of the diaphragm not opening your lungs or the skin and the musculature and the musculoskeletal system around the chest restricting. And usually it's kind of... Does anybody know this? Well, I would know and you would know because okay. you have involvement of the skin. You do this, you're not. Okay. Yeah, you cannot take a deep breath. But we can help you, I mean, we can help, that's what we do, we can help figure you out. So it's actually mostly the skin, it's, it's rarely the diaphragm, although I've seen it too. Yeah. And especially in patients that have um, lupus covariance, there's something called, it's a very interesting name of vanishing lung syndrome, where the diaphragm keeps like going up and up because it just kind of squishes the lungs up. Oh. More, I saw, yes, please. If, and what you're saying about the lung, you get a child that has, uh, oh, thank you, you get a child that has uh, severe asthma at the age of three, mm. and has it all her life, and as she was growing up, went in the hospital and oxygen had some things of this nature, what does that have to do, does that have anything to do with 40 years down the road, contacting full limited scleroderma? Not that we can tell, unfortunately. But, but asthma is actually sadly so prevalent, and it's actually growing in prevalence, that soon, you know, we all are going to have a little bit of it because of the stuff floating around here. But, so I don't know of any direct relationship. Just curious. Mm -hmm. I will let you pass the microphone and educate. So someone who was diagnosed with JRA 
at age 12, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and then um, scleroderma in 90, 96, mm. and then the lung problems started in 2012. I'm still confused as to whether I have limited or <laughs> diffuse. I, I, yeah, that's okay, because, because we're, your confusion matches our confusion. <laughs> And it really doesn't matter because we just treat everybody more or the same way. <laughs> and it has to do with the people with mixed conditions, all bets are off. And borderline lupus for gray years, lupus for many years. And nobody, years. nobody can, nobody knows anything about sure. And then, um, you know, the unfortunate thing is, so here's where it gets very interesting. Here's where, is our second speaker here? There it is. Um, so, Certain rheumatologists are very dogmatic about these things, and certain rheumatologists are not very dogmatic about these things. And, and so the way, well, I want you to comment on this when you get up here, because they don't invite us to their parties. <laughs> Rheumato Thank you. Rheumatologists get together, and they decide, because the field is so complicated, in order to make sense of it, in this fuzziness, they draw lines around the biggest concentration of fact so they can get a handle around it. So they create these entities based on logic, best we know about that physiology, best we know of everything. But you have to be sympathetic. These things bleed into each other all the time. And, and they try to draw a line around it, but it's not easy. And, and just like Supreme Court opinions, it moves here and there. And they don't invite us. So for instance, as far as I know, like you can have all these things that define lupus, but your lungs dying from lupus is not actually one of the lupus defining illnesses because you don't invite us. And we can tell you sometimes these things actually just happen first. And so they are, so it doesn't really, I mean, yes. So the answer is I have no idea. But we, is that you that you treat both the same? In a way, in a way. So here's what happens. At least this is my approach. If we know what is your prevalent autoimmune disease, we treat it with the drugs that seem to help the prevalent autoimmune diseases. Um, if we don't, and the person with the sickest organ takes the lead. So like if the skin is the more prevalent organ and the lung is not that involved, we sort of let our rheumatology colleagues do whatever and, and whatever they see fit for their, the rest of the body. And then if the rest of the body is doing okay, but the lungs are going bad, we intervene. And we're much less sophisticated than they are. So if your lung is involved for a majority of these things, we do the same thing. So that distinction matters less than you think. Matters a little bit, but not as much as you think. Yeah, what matters is what are you doing? What is your lung doing? Um, that matters more. Dr. Yes. Well, I was last year I had a kidney failure due to a scleroderma renal crisis, and um, I was told by a rheumatologist that studies show that enzymes in the blood, if you already had kidney failure, the likelihood of it showing up in the lungs is not likely. You know anything about that? Well, that's sort of maybe the, the difference between limited and diffuse. There may be some, problem, but I mean, those are just suggestions. They're not like dogma, you know? It's not an assurance that if you have one, you're not going to get the other one. It's just patterns and trends that we used to quiz ourselves in, uh, in tests. And then, but remember, this is what you don't know, and this is what I teach my residents. It's scary, but it's okay. We actually are always playing a game of 21, always. What do we think that by doing something, we're gonna win or lose? We're never sure. So we always know like, you know, don't, don't ask for a card after 11 or whatever, we card count. So these things that you say are card counting. Meaning like you look and you're trying to sort of give yourself a little edge by thinking, is this kind of, but at the end it doesn't matter. You do your best and whatever happens, happens. So, yes and no. <laughs> Last question. Okay, any studies about scleroderma affecting lungs after transplants? Yes, it happens. 
It happens. <laughs> it's kind of scary, isn't it? And uh, it's plain a little bit, or I'm sorry. And you say um, it's plain a little bit in the studies, or you just have some I, statistics? I, yeah, I, I, I think it happens not frequently, but I. I I just read something about it. I'm trying to remember um, a presentation in the American Thoracic Society, and it, it must be less than like five percent of people that get scleroderma again after. Yeah, it must be a low number. The uh, unfortunate thing about lung transplant is so two things about lung transplant. One unfortunate. We have not mastered the technology of having the lungs work well as a transplant. It is the suckiest of all transplants, sadly. On a positive note, we're growing lungs. And the technology to grow a lung is maybe five to 10 years away. It's not far. They literally are doing either 3D printing and then putting stem cells on top of lungs and growing something that is a lung, or they take a pig and yes, ladies and gentlemen, it turns out we have a lot in common with pigs. It dissolves the cells, and then they run stem cells on top of it. So, so it turns out stem cells need instructions. You know, when you hear about stem cell therapy, it used to be 40,000, now it's down to 8,000. Florida is a, is a hub for stem cell transplant. Um, I think it's down to seven to $8,000, and tons of my patients get it. I encourage them not to. Uh, but then when they say they pay for it, I really say, okay, let's let's go for the placebo effect. Let's believe. Um, the reason why most of the time it doesn't work is these stem cells need instructions. And so what this structure of the pig lung does is it provides the instructions for the stem cells to actually do what they're supposed to be doing. So when there's nothing there in instructions, the stem cells go and evolve into what they need to evolve into, and then they help each other. One cell becoming something tells the cells around it what they should be, and then the whole thing sort of is a it's a beautiful symphony that happens in, 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 in utero, but we're trying to sort of force it um, ex utero. And, and I think they're having good success. So I think in a few years you will, you will see it. So, other questions? And then I have to finish it. Okay. Yo. So, pardon? Um, you, said, you said you're going to go through gastro and lung. No. I will say a few words, but no, not really. I want to focus on lung, since I'm a lung. You really want to. I, by the, I can focus on gastro, but not on, on, on cooking. <laughs> Any? I, was, I was looking for the connection where insufficient gastro acid control may work towards deteriorating lung yeah. function. Yeah, actually there's more and more evidence to do that, that, that if you have any Hypo hernia, stomach acid that should be treated. It's a big controversy among lung doctors. They go back and forth yell at each other about this. It's not, it's not proven 100%, but I actually am a believer in that, so if you have acid reflux, I try to treat it as much as I can, in spite of the dementia and other pneumonia and other things. I do. So this is what we used to do. We used to say, okay, if you have limited disease on the lungs, meaning less than 20%, that that was okay, you're good, it's not gonna progress. But if you had more than 20% in the lung, that was worse, you are gonna progress, so you need to be treated. And if you were in the middle, then you would look at pulmonary function tests and see how you do blowing a candle and how much air you can blow out to make that decision. If you had extensive disease, we would treat you. If you had limited disease, we would watch you. And this sort of was a paradigm I was using for a very long time. And what did we use? But in our disposal was a few drugs. Cytoxan, which we tried to get IV, oral. Salsep came about in SLS2, and actually, very quickly, in spite of mountains of evidence became the go-to for lung disease because experientially it seems to work. Actually, in fact, I think much better than in this study. And actually, the latest study that was just published, I happened to peek into some subgroup analysis that wasn't published, the study for the pulmonary fibrosis drug was even a better uh, vindication of cell set than it was of the new drug. 
So it worked actually better than the new drug, but together they worked even better together. So the go-to now for patients starting, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, cell side. Azapactin is a little weak here and has some side effects, but it has been shown limited uh, series to have some effect, and of course lung transplant as a uh, final um, way out. Most rigorously studied in the treatment of scleroderma ILD, it suggests that um, use of cytoxan be sort of uh, an important part of the treatment and strongly considered as first-line treatment in patients with systemic sclerosis based on data, uh, especially if you're having an acute, very um, um, sort of exuberant initial decline, because we know the people that suddenly sort of explode in their skin and their lungs, maybe that, you should hit it with the hardest thing you have, which is the cytoxan, and, and get it under control before and certainly maybe after that, switch to um, salsa. Imurin, an alternative to cyclophosphamide as maintenance um, for uh, after reactivation, and initial actually treatment also. And then salsa, with some retrospective studies showing benefits in terms of uh, um, F FVC or DLCO, which is the diffusion capacity, which is a surrogate for oxygenation capabilities. And then um, there was actually even some worsening in the treat that group that was treated. So we know that it basically just slows things down and doesn't stop it. And that's actually the sad truth about um, other, um, um, about some patients is that Sometimes we just can't stop it in spite of the best thing we have. And the best thing we have is maybe initial therapy with cytoxan if it's a very exuberant response, and IV cytoxan, in fact, followed by cell sap. As a predictor of progressive ILD, we talked about anti CLS 70 and nuclear pattern being things that suggest it could happen more often, diffuse scleroderma, which we just talked about. But it could happen. Um, with other patients too, and this doesn't mean that you're necessarily worse off. So these are just, again, what people don't realize is medicine is a game of basically just playing the odds. Um, we, we, we play the probabilities, we basically play the game for you to try to make the best guess, best treatment, but it's all a form of educated guesses. And Probably you have to treat it because if you actually stop treating it, it sort of long term doesn't help. We know that. That doesn't necessarily mean that if you do it, it will work, but it certainly means if you don't do it, it doesn't. So this is a summary you asked about other organs, and this is really hard to read for me too. Um, they were basically um, looking at uh, just a summary, a quick summary. I'm not going to dwell on it because some of them are not my area of specialty. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a few of them. So calcium channel blockers, good level of evidence, intravenous iloprost, these are to treat Raynaud's, um, fluoxetine for people who have Raynaud's issues. We actually do this in our hospital, bring people in and give them IV prostacyclins for a few days to sort of abort the finger damage and then maybe do it every three months. Uh, Bocentan also has been shown to work for digital ulcers and PD5 inhibitors such as uh, uh, Viagra and also intravenous iloprost, so the digital ulcer we know is going together just in a, in a certain way. Then pulmonary inhibitor hypertension, we have a lot of drugs that work very well for it. Um, skin and lung disease, we talked about um, some of them already. Cyclophosphamide for scleroderma ILD, particularly if it's progressive. And then actually, um, um, we talked about you know, stem cell transplant for selected patients. The problem with stem cells is even though it worked, it has such morbidity and mortality. It sort of is not, has not become the standard of care, but sort of something that 
Um, you do if you are brave and probably younger. I know maybe you can comment on that, but if you haven't started doing that, then you get out there. Um, and renal cell crisis, yeah, ACE inhibitors may, may, um, may work, but usually actually controlling blood pressures um, in patients who are receiving glucocorticoids is sort of uh, something good to do with a level of recognition C, which means we're not 100% sure. We talked about gastrointestinal diseases. We have a B level to do protopump inhibitors for gastroesophageal reflux disease and to prevent esophageal ulcers and restrictors, but I think this actually affects the lungs as well. And prokinetic agents, plus minus, and intermediate rotating antibodies for bacterial overgrowth, which we have very little evidence for, but we do it because we try to help you. So natural history of the disease, we talked about it, up to 80% have interstitial lung disease on high-risk CAT scan. One third to one fourth is progressive. The rest of them either slow down or are controllable with the disease. Inflammation and rapid loss, especially in diffuse patients, happens in the first few years and then slowly becomes slower. Um, if it scars, it's irreversible, but the inflammation part of it is more um, reversible. So if you have more inflammation and less fibrosis, it's better. So this is a big question that I was pondering which was, okay, so let's say you have an antifibrotic that works. Here's your anti. We know the disease is a combination of fibrosis and inflammation. We're already doing these things, cytoxan, uh, Celsept, Imuran, Rituxanab, and other agents to deal with inflammation, to decrease the inflammation and to not let the inflammation result in fibrosis. Let's say that one of the drugs that are approved for pulmonary fibrosis and now approved for fibrosis and scleroderma. Does that mean we use it at the same time? Do we use it afterwards? How are we going to deal with this duality? Or are we going to use it in patients by intelligently looking at how much inflammation they have versus how much scarring they have? So I actually um, worked with Boringer Ingelheim, which is these are the makers of Nintetinib, the drug that was just recently approved. And we got a group of rheumatologists and a group of pulmonologists to participate in a Delphi study to see if um, what are the views of rheumatologists versus pulmonologists on what to do about this in terms of, okay, so how do we screen for it? How do we treat it? How long do we treat it? How do we define success? And this was just presented in American Thoracic Society. And the way we did it, this was developed in World War II as a way to try to guess what the future is. If you, if you look at the, um, the Oracle of Delphi, somebody who sort of looks into the future, etc. And this has been useful. The Army used it, the Navy used it once when they lost the submarine. They lost the submarine and they asked all the hands and the captains and the chiefs where is this? This is the last time. This was the mission of the submarine. This is where it was. We lost contact here. Where do you think it is? So what they did was basically everybody said, well, where do you think it is? So some people said, well, I think these guys, I know this area, there's a bad current here. They may have gone to the left to avoid it, so I think they're there. And then somebody said, no, they went straight, and you probably lost them about here because you lost contact there probably a day later. They were dead because they were supposed to contact for two days later. So people gave what they said was their opinions, and then they circulated it again, asking people, hey, your comrades think, actually, they didn't used to call them comrades back then because we were fighting with the Soviet Union. So, so your, your friends thought that these are the options. What do you think? and people voted on it. And it turns out when you use that, and people look at, oh yeah, you know, he may be right. I'm gonna go behind his theory. And so when people voted, it actually accurately predicted where that submarine was. So it turns out that it's sort of taking advantage of our collective wisdom tends to be better than our individual thoughts. So this is what this takes advantage of. And if you have worked with uh, academic physicians, believe me, this is a very hard thing to do, to get these people to agree on anything. Not to mention just answer their mails. So, 
We basically said, if you agree, you will either strongly agree, which is a five, or strongly disagree, which is minus five. And we said it's agree if you're above 2.5, and when we do the whole thing, it's not a standard deviation, it doesn't go below zero, which means that it's mostly four if you're above 2.5. And these are the things we agreed on, and I put it in a cartoon format to summarize it. We agreed, and if you haven't had this, you should. We agreed that everybody should have a high-risk CT. Have all of you had a high-risk CT? If you haven't had a high-risk CT, Get them. Okay, the next thing we agreed on is for sure they should listen to your lungs and ask if you have shortness of breath and do chest auscultation. And for sure you have to have full PFDs, not just bronchi, you have full PFD. So when you start having the disease, and pretty much on a yearly basis, you should have these things. Maybe not the high risk CAT scans, although there's a center in Sweden that was doing them every year to follow patients. I think if you do that, you're going to end up glowing in the dark. <laughs> Which has its advantage. <laughs> so who do you treat? So we agreed that anybody who has a very who has bad lung disease on the breathing test and has any interstitial lung disease should be treated. Because you could have bad lung disease and have other problems like the muscles that we talked about. But if you have you should have lung disease. We said anybody with more than 20% on high risk CT. And anybody with 10% that has any abnormal breathing test. Or people with diffuse disease would have, which have a little bit of ILD, if they're high risk, they should be treated too. So this group was actually even more aggressive than the original um, agreement or a study that divided people based on 80 and 70%. We said, hey, if you're a high risk patient with early diffuse disease and you have ILD, let's treat because this goes so quickly that by the time we try to think and hem and haw, you may have lost a bunch of lungs before we can go back and fix it. And then, you know, obvious if your CAT scans are getting worse and you have declining PFDs, no matter what they are, if the direction is bad, even if you start with very good, that's not good. And we said, if all of these are okay, but some of your saturations are going down, that's also maybe a consideration, but we weren't sure. When it comes to treatment, we said cell set. Just go with cell set. There was no agreement with cytoxan, even though the Europeans actually suggested that that was a better initial treatment. And then, when it was to impending, and at this point we didn't know if it was going to be approved, we said, well, you could use it with, or you could use it after the cell set hasn't worked. So if I have any one of you that is doing anything other than being impeccable, it's probably a good, a good um, suggestion that you should go on the new drug. And I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second. So what do we do? We look at follow-up in the change of PFDs. We look at CAT scans. We look at stabilization or improvement of breathing tests and CAT scans and symptoms and how you feel. And then we said, if we, do, if we have success, let's hold on to it for two years and not start taking people off drugs for two years. And if everything is great after two years, maybe we could start backing off and see if we can get away with it. Because in some patients, this burns out or stops. And then it's always upon us to sort of figure it out, but not before two years of aggressive therapy. So this study, which was called the census trial, was an internet in systemic sclerosis, and this one actually was more ambitious than all of us. They basically said if there was any high-res involvement, more than 10%, that you should get treated, as long as your lung capacity was less than 90%, which a lot of people's lung capacity is less than 90%. Even if you were on nothing or on something, you were allowed to participate in this trial. And it was for a year, half the people got placebo, and other, with whatever treatment they were getting, which for some was nothing, for others was cell set or whatever they were getting. And then it was just revealed that, uh, so they were looking at, their primary endpoint was the breathing test, and they were looking at um, other uh, symptoms of quality of care and skin scoring, 
because they were hoping that this antifibrotic would actually work for the skin too. It didn't, unfortunately. It's I think too mild that the doses were not adjusted correctly, but it didn't work for the skin, but it did work for the primary endpoint, which was slowing the decline. This was the decline for people that were not on it, and this was the decline for people that were on it. And you can see towards the end, there was about 50, 40 ml of lung saved after a year. This was just recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's not 2009, it's 2019. So, in summary, great news for those with interstitial lung disease. We now have something else that for the first time in a large randomized control trial. Why didn't we have randomized control trials before? Because a drug company had to use a drug that is brand new to make a ton of money off of it, and intended it is between seventy to hundred thousand dollars. So they were willing to do this, but cell set and others they're past their prime, and nobody's going to do a large randomized control trial. NIH and others did the, um, and, and more central organizations are supposed to help, and they sometimes help. But so good news either way. We now have another tool in our armamentarium, whether we all decide to go on it right away or decide that if the disease is mild, to go on CELSEP and see if it stabilizes and then only use it afterwards or to go on it concomitantly, we will see how that plays out. So, okay, questions.